Bibles and turn with me to the 24th Psalm. 24th Psalm. This is, the, this is the third psalm in a trinity of shepherd psalms. Beginning now, verse 1, Psalm 24, The earth is the Lord's, and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. For he hath founded it upon the seas, and established it upon the floods. Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord? Or who shall stand in his holy place? He that hath clean hands and a pure heart, who hath not lifted up his soul unto vanity, nor sworn deceitfully. He shall receive the blessing from the Lord and righteousness from God of his salvation. This is the generation of them that seek him, that seek thy face, O Jacob. Lift up your heads. O ye gates, and be ye lift up, ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, even lift them up, ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord of hosts, He is the King of glory. Now just think about that. <laughs> That's what Selah means, by the way. It's a rest, musical rest. And this is a song that is sung. And any time in the book of Psalms when you see Selah after it, it says, now pause and just think of that. I think there's three Three questions it's asked in this psalm and answered. <clears throat> who owns the earth in this world? <laughs> who is the king of glory and who are these who will rule and reign with him? <coughs> this is, of course, the third psalm of the Trinity of Psalms. The first one, he dies. The middle one, he lives. The third one, he comes. <laughs> The first one is where he dies on the cross, and that's where you get your salvation from, that death. The second one is he lives in your life, and that's where you have your soul saved. And this third one is he's coming again to reward those who diligently seek him, those who seek him and seek thy face into the kingdom. These are the one who will rule and reign with him. It's interesting, you know, this song, we call it Psalm, but this song uh, was composed by David on, in a very, very special uh, uh, moment when they brought the ark from uh, Kerjoth, Jerem, to Mount Zion, in through the gates, and it was there it waiting for the temple to be built so that they could put the ark in there. The ark of the covenant is God's presence here upon the earth. Back under the law, as you recall, God actually spoke from the cherubim that were molded into the mercy seat. So it stands for the presence of God. It is a perfect type of Christ. As we look at the ark, it is made of a, a kind of wood that will not rot, standing for his human nature. It was, it was gold plated on top of that, which stands for his deity to show that he is God man. And inside of that ark was the law of God, was placed also the pot of uh, manna, showing that he feeds those who are saved. First, they're saved, and he fulfills the law for them. Now they're fed, and also uh, you have the staff there that blooms without being planted, <laughs> showing resurrection, <coughs> showing new life that's in Christ. 
And I can see, you know, in my mind's eye, maybe the thousands of people as they brought the ark up that day. And Josephus, a first century historian, tells us there were seven choirs of singers that were going in front of it, singing this song. And there were, uh, there were solos that asked questions and they were answered. And we see the questions in this psalm. Who is the King of glory? And then the other solo would come in, the Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Over and over, this psalm was chanted or sung by the choirs as they marched before the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark coming up through the city gates to be, uh, uh, to be placed in the temple when that was finished is a type of Jesus Christ coming back to this earth, setting up His kingdom and ruling over this earth. And uh, we call this another shepherd psalm or the last of the three shepherd psalm. And to show you this in the New Testament, turn with me to 1 Peter chapter, uh, chapter uh, 4, excuse me, chapter 5. And in the first, second, and third, fourth verses, we read these words, The elders which are among you I exhort, who am also an elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that should, shall be revealed. And then he says to these elders, Feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, nor uh, not for lo uh, filthy lucre, but of a ready mind, neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being in samples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd shall appear, ye shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. Now we have the chief shepherd. You remember these three Psalms. The first one is the good shepherd. That's when He came to die for you. Now He's living in your, with your life, or in your life. And uh, this is called the Great Shepherd. Now here we come to the second coming, Him coming back. And here He is portrayed as the Chief Shepherd. Now we go into some of our questions. Who owns the earth and the world and the Scriptures? bring that out in, as a question here in Psalm. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell within. Who owns it all? Not the president, <laughs> not the kings of this world, not the communists, uh, not the Arab, not the Muslims. <laughs> God owns it. <laughs> Scripture says He not only owns the earth, but He owns all the people that are in it. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world, and they that dwell therein. All of it is His. For He hath founded upon the seas and established it upon the floods. If you go back and study Genesis 1-9, you'll see that He spoke and brought the waters that were there into one place and dry land appeared. And that was the beginning of His establishing of this world. He established it upon the waters and upon the floods. And uh, he then is God Almighty Himself. Uh, at the beginning of Genesis 1:1, it says, "And God said, Let uh, let there actually when he when he created man, he says, and let and, and let uh, let's create man in our image." Uh, in the very first verse, he says. Uh, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. In both places he, God uses the word Elohim, which is a plural of God. In the beginning God's created the heavens and the earth. And God said, God's said, let us make man in our own image. There we see the Trinity. In first, uh, well in Colossians. There's so many places in the Bible, and I'm thinking of Galatians right now. 
that says that Christ created all things that are created. Those are in heaven, those that are in earth, those that are visible, and those that are invisible. So the psalm here is speaking of the King of glory who shall come in. We're going to see that He is Christ, and Christ is the one that created all things. Now, as we understand that, we come to the second question. Uh, I've put it according to the psalm itself, Who shall ascend unto the hill of the Lord? And the Scripture says, He that has clean hands and a pure heart. Clean hands and a pure heart. And has not lifted up his soul unto vanity, nor so sworn deceitfully. When this day comes, he shall receive the blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. And this, this is a generation of people that seek him. Seek thy face. It isn't enough for us just to be saved. We must seek him diligently according to the New Testament. When the scripture says, and he is a rewarder of them that seek him diligently or that diligently seek him. So here we have the question, who shall ascend unto the hill of the Lord? First, he that hath clean hands and a pure heart. Hands is a symbol of your work. Clean hands is a symbol of work that is done for the Lord and not work that's done in this world. Those that are messed up in the things of the world have dirty hands. Those that have clean hands are not stained with the sins of this world. Pure heart means a Christ-controlled life. And of course, all this comes directly from the Word of God. In the Beatitudes, it said, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. It means one who stays in the Word, one who has a submissive life, a yielded life to God. And uh, so we see those that will ascend unto the hill, meaning the government of God. Hill is always government or mountain is government. Those we understand from New Testament theology, those who will rule and reign with him are those who have a pure heart, clean hands first, and then a pure heart. Now, none of us by ourselves can have a pure heart and clean hands. Every day we get our hands dirty, and every day we have impure thoughts in our heart. We know that. God has provided a way for us, though, to have clean hands and a pure heart through confession, confession of sins. Scripture also says, if we judge ourselves, we'll not be judged. When you sin, if you judge yourself and ask God to forgive you, you'll never be judged. All that will be erased from the pages of the indictment as you stand there at the judgment seat of Christ. So he's trying to describe those who will gain the reward in, in the due time, and we know that time is uh, upon us now, really. We're, we're living right in the end days, just before the rapture of the church, when we're all going to be called home, and we'll all, all have our day that great day of judgment when uh, Christ will examine our lives. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ to receive the things done in our body, whether good or evil. So, the Bible calls on us to be uh, one that's in the Word, to have a submissive life, to be yielded to God. These are those who have clean sins. And then when they do that, clean hands and pure hearts, they become seekers. This is a generation of them that seek him and seek thy face, O Jacob. Now just think about that. That's what the Bible says. And he says, let's pause and think about that a minute. As we continue to think about it, we understand that not all the saved will ascend unto the hill or the government of the Lord. Only the overcomers. And this is decided at the judgment seat of Christ. Now, what is an overcomer? 
What is an overcomer? Well, the Greek word for overcome means victory. Victory. And it means a contest or conflict ending in victory. You become then an overcomer. However, if a Christian is overcome by the lust of the flesh and the love of material possessions, he will lose his rewards. Now, there's some people that believe when you're saved that uh, you automatically become an overcomer. And uh, the answer to that is no. No, when you're saved, you get eternal life. You get, uh, you get the promise from God that uh, you'll be in heaven and you'll have eternal life. It has nothing to do with rewards. That they're not given automatically. If a Christian was automatically overcame just because he was a believer, then no Christian could sin or backslide. Let's look at it that way. You couldn't sin or backslide. <laughs> All this has to be won. There'd be no conflict, no great fight of faith. All the warnings then that God gives us and tells us to strive for maturity would be for naught. Wouldn't count. And uh, we would be perfect. <laughs> no, God saved you. That gave you then eternal life. Now you have a trek that is, in this life, a path to follow, a path to run, if you might, you can say run or walk. <clears throat> and that is the way that God wants you to go. And that is a path that produces the things that God wants produced in your life. But remember again, you can't produce these things. God has to produce them through you. And this calls then for a yielded life handing everything over to Him for Him to make those decisions in your life and cause, us, and cause the events in your life to take place that you will be a part of that will honor and give Him glory. For those Christians who live that kind of life, there will be five crowns given. I think of the crown of victory in 1 Thessalonians 2.19. This is for soul winning. Now, when I say soul winning, I don't mean going out and leading someone to Jesus. It's going out and those who are already saved lead them into a life, a righteous life that God wants them to lead. And so it's one who you go out and, and uh, win their souls, so to speak, to Christ, their lives to Christ after they're saved. And for that, there is a crown of victory that's going to be given. Also, there is a crown of righteousness. I think all of us remember, let me see if I can turn to that one for you. Uh, I think all of us remember Paul saying in 2 Timothy chapter 4, beginning in verse uh, 7, he says, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not only to me, but unto all them also that love his appearing. Now, there's two things about this crown. Paul loved the appearing of Christ only because he knows, knew that he had done all the things that God wanted him to do. He had fought a good fight, he had finished his course, and he had kept the faith. And uh, he says, therefore, there's a crown of righteousness laid up. But he said, not only for me, but not only just for me, but for all those who love his appearing. In order to love his appearing, you have to run the race, you have to fight a good fight, and you have to keep, keep the faith. And I can witness to you, me living close to the end of my promised time on the earth. When, people say, when are you going to quit? And my answer is, I never will quit until the Lord tells me to. I may end up being one who stumbles, really stumbles around and bumbles around, you know, with uh, preaching the message of God, but 
I'll be here until that time comes because I want to be counted as faithful and as one who has, who has uh, fought a good fight and finished the course and kept the faith. And yes, anyone who does this loves his appearing. If you're doing this now in your life, you're loving his appearing. Just don't fall away from it. Then we have the crown of life. The crown of life is found in James 1.12, and it's for the enduring temptation and tribulation that comes in your life. It's for you also enduring all these things that come into your life. Because you see, the devil's going to be fighting against it. You need to endure it. And when things aren't going right, and it looks like you're almost at the end of your health, or at the end of your money, or whatever, understand temptation and tribulation God allows in your life for you to trust Him more each day. And you need to learn to be an overcomer in order to gain this crown of life. Temptation and tribulation. I think often of the first century Christians when they were thrown into the Colosseum there at Rome where the hungry lions were, and they, they remained faithful unto death. Not until death, but unto death. What great trip temptation they had to, recap, to, to go back and, and uh, say that they didn't know the Lord in order to, that they might be saved from this terrible, uh, this terrible time of the lions, hungry lions. What great tribulation they went through. Those that died and kept the faith, there'll be a crown of life for them. But I think it goes, this goes even today. We don't have lions, hungry lions to eat us up. But we do have many, many other temptations and tribulations of this 21st century every day. Give it all over to the Lord and let Him give you the strength to overcome. Then I think of the crown of glory that I read earlier in 1 Peter 5, 1, 4, where the chief shepherd will come one day. This is for those who are faithful in feeding the flock. Feeding the flock. Some of you are in a position to feed others. And I know this primarily speaks of those who are called to do it, but I don't know where uh, this cuts out, whether you have to be strictly an ordained minister. I don't believe so. I believe anybody that's uh, called to teach others can be a shepherd. And if you're faithful to that in feeding the flock, you'll gain a crown when the chief shepherd appears. And then you have the incorruptible crown. That's found in... 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 25. I want to read that one to you. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Verse, I will begin here in verse 25. I'll actually begin in verse 24. 1, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 24. Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize, so run that ye may obtain. I want to pause here. You're in a race, and you must, ra you must run as if you can be the only one that can win the race. Only one winner. <laughs> Yet we know that's not true in the spiritual race. In a, in a way, I think, or in a sense, I think, you're running, you're running uh, and your competition is yourself. It's trying to hold you back, the old self. All right, let's continue. Verse 25, And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. Well, I want to pause there for a second. Here we have the picture of the uh, Grecian games. We call it the Olympics today. And we have a race going on. And when, the, when they finished the race, the one who gained the victory there got a crown of laurel leaves that faded away after some time. Paul likens on that onto the spiritual race that we're in. When we get through with this life, or, 
or when we are raptured, whichever comes first, we meet Christ at the judgment seat of Christ, and we've lived the way He wants us to live. And here we've run a good race. He will give us a crown that will not fade away. Not like the Olympics, but one that lasts forever. And a crown, by the way, means sovereign, making one sovereign in ruling and reigning. Now let's look at it again. It's an incorruptible crown, the bottom of verse 25. So Paul says in verse 26, I therefore so run, not as uncertainly, so fight I not as one that beateth the air. He says, I am in a real race. I am committed to this race. It is a certain race. And I'm in a real fight, and I'm not shadow boxing. I got a real opponent. The real opponent, of course, is Satan, the flesh, the world, all these that would cause me to, to slide away and not to win the race. I'm all out in winning this race. Now, verse 27. But I keep under my body and bring it into subjection. That's how an athlete does. He trains and trains and trains to keep his body into subjection. Now, we can understand the training in this Christian life keeping ourselves in subjection to the things of God, lest that by any means when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. No, that doesn't mean lose your salvation. Paul in another place says, I know whom I have believed, and he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. No, this is not loss of salvation. It is the Greek word, castaway is the Greek word, uh, the Greek word for that is adokimas, and it means disapproved. And he's really saying, after I do all these things, I do it with all my strength and all my might, lest that by any means when I have finished all this course, preaching to others, I myself should be disapproved. Disapproved. Now, you know, Paul, at this particular point in his life, he didn't know whether he'd gained a crown or not. Only just before he died, when he finished his ministry, that God revealed it to him. In Philippians, the Apostle Paul speaks of those things that he, were, that he was trying to attain. Attain means, you see, through works, through the power of the Spirit, to attain. He wanted to attain unto the out-resurrection which is the resurrection out from among those who will be raised from the dead. Which, uh, in other words, is that resurrection special choosing at the judgment seat of Christ that will make up the bride of Christ. And so we see that he had that concern that he might be disapproved. How much more for us living in this world today. Then we come to the next question as we go back to our text. Who is the King of glory? Who is the King of glory? And the answer, the Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. The Lord strong and mighty. This is a description of Him coming again. I would imagine that was quite thrilling for the choirs as they were, went before singing with the ark bef uh, in, in back of them as they went and, and uh, escorted the ark up the hill, up to Mount Sinai, and they opened the gates and brought it on in, and they were singing, Who is the King of glory? And then the other soloist or the other choir, as it may have been, would say, the Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Beloved, when the Lord comes back, there is so many scriptures concerning His second coming. I had someone ask me one time, how come you preach so much on the second coming? Why don't you preach on the church? <laughs> well, I looked it up. Jesus only mentioned the church twice, <laughs> both of them in Matthew. 
but several hundred times throughout the New Testament we see references to his second coming. All right. I've chosen three descriptions to show the coming of the Lord strong and mighty. First in Revelation chapter 20 or 19, chapter 19, verse 11. And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called faithful and true. In righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, and out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and he treadeth the winepress of the fishness and wrath of Almighty God. That's the book of Revelation. Then I think of the book of Isaiah. And many times it's mentioned his second coming through Isaiah and Jeremiah. But I've chosen chapter 34, verse, beginning in verse 4. And all the host of heaven shall be dissolved, and the heavens shall ro be rolled together as a scroll, and all their hosts shall fall down as the leaf falleth off from the vine, and as a falling fig from the fig tree. And my sword shall be bathed in heaven. Behold, it shall come down upon I dominion upon the people of, of, my, cur of my curse to judgment. And then I think back to the New Testament, just one of the Gospels. Is it in the Gospels? Let's look in the book of Luke, chapter 21, verse 25 through 27. All these, of course, are some of my favorites. In verse 25 of the 21st chapter of Luke, and, the, and there shall be signs in the sun, and in the moon, and in the stars, and upon earth distress of nations with perplexity. The sea and the waves roaring. Folks, I want to pause there right now. You're already seeing this. With all this, with the terrorist and how all the world, how all the world is today. The world today is distress of nations with perplexity. And the sea which stands for the nations of the world and the waves roaring. The waves stand for the evilness in the world. We don't have a calm sea. <laughs> and then, as this continues as from now on to the coming of the Lord, we see in verse 26, men's hearts failing them for fear and for looking after those things which are coming on earth. For the powers of heaven shall be shaken. Already people are, they're not doing what they did before September 11th. They're living in fear. They're beginning to say, our lives have changed forever. And they're looking after those things which are coming on the earth. And now it switches into the heavens. For the powers of heaven shall be shaken, and then they shall see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. And when these things begin to pass, come to pass, then look up and lift up your heads, for your redemption draweth nigh. Now he's speaking to the Jews of that day. At this particular time, you and I will have already been gone for seven years. We'll be watching over the parapets of heaven as he comes back to fight. We don't come back on horses to fight with him. If you look closely at that one, that, uh, that verse over there in Revelation about the other armies of heaven on white horses with clean linen. No, those are armies. It's in the plural. And they're angelic armies. They're armies of heaven that come with him. Oh, yes, we will come back and rule and reign with him those who gain that high privilege. All of the saved will see this happen. How great that will be. And what a day to look forward to. 
And in verse 28 he says, And when these things begin to pass, then look up, and lift your heads, for your redemption draweth nigh. We're in that day. We're in that day now. April 1948, our Lord in prophecy says that He is standing at the door. He's ready to come in. It's been some uh, 50, you know, four years, 53, 54 years since that date when Israel became a nation. Jesus says, I'm still standing at the door ready to come in. And the events of this world are measuring up according to all prophecy. Yet we as a church are still here upon the earth. He cannot come until He takes the church out first. And when that day, great day comes, when millions of people will all of a sudden be missing around the world, then there'll be about seven years before all this occurs. The rapture, though, is imminent and must occur first. Going back to our text, who is this King of glory? And the text answers it, the Lord, strong and mighty. I want to read it to you again. The Lord, strong and mighty, the Lord, mighty in battle. Lift up your gates, O ye gates, even lift them up, ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory. Now you think about that. <laughs> when He came in on Palm Sunday, He came to the East Gate. The East Gate. <clears throat> they say that it was bricked up. <laughs> of course, we know Jerusalem was destroyed, but that particular gate was bricked up, and it won't be um, unbricked, if that's a good word. <laughs> Those bricks won't be, uh, won't come out of it, and that gate be open again until the Lord comes. The first time He came on a donkey, tears in His eyes. The second time, a white charger with fire in His eyes. Oh, beloved, if you're ever going to do anything for Christ, now's the time to do it. Jesus Christ is God the Creator. All sin fit, entered in and all creation fell. But God still owns it. He's got the title deed to it. It's going to be opened in heaven just before He comes back to claim it all. Jesus Christ is coming again to set up His kingdom. And who will reign with Him? The overcomers, those that have a clean hand and a pure heart, and those that seek His face. Father, thank You again for Your Word. Bless it to our hearts and our lives and all those who hear this by tape recording. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You're